there's another aspect to this whole program. Me, I'm talking me, Richard Doty. I'm not talking about anybody else. I didn't ever uh, strong arm anyone, threaten anyone, pull a gun on anyone, although I carried a gun. Uh, threaten them with, with, with crimes or threaten them to kill them or their families because they wouldn't cooperate. Never, ever happened. Now, did it happen within the intelligence community? Do I know cases where it happened? Absolutely. Wasn't me. I never did it. You talk about the men in black. We There was a section uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., headed by a person I knew very well that did the dirty tricks. Thank you for listening to this incredible two-hour episode of My Alien Life. I am joined by Richard Doty. Mr. Doty is a retired special agent who worked for the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation. There are no subjects off limits. We talk about UFOs, aliens, and the U.S. government's secret programs. My Alien Life is recorded live from atop the Northern Rocky Mountains and is available on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and everywhere fine podcasts are found. My website is at www.myalienlifepodcast.com. There you will find my email address, all previously recorded shows, and more. I am Cameron Brower. This is My Alien Life, and the podcast starts right now. I feel very fortunate to have Richard Doty in the studio. Mr. Doty has had a very interesting life, to say the least, and I'm ready to jump right in and hopefully answer some questions and shed some light on an often confusing career. Mr. Doty, welcome to the show. And am I just guessing, but when I look at your career and become extremely confused, would you say that was because of a job well done? Yes, definitely. Job well done. <laughs> um, that's... Uh... I've, I've had that said before, uh, but not by the UFO community. And I want to welcome you again to the show. And, and again, thank you for your service. We will get to some backstory in a moment, but I want to ask you about Mirage Men, which I think is a good movie. It's really confusing and it's hard for me to uh, maintain a track on that and, and try to try to even figure out what your life was like because it, it throws so much information initially at you and and you're left kind of hanging trying to figure your figure that out how are you approached to do a movie about your life well i wasn't um i met uh, mark uh, pinkleton and uh, john lundenberg in uh, laughlin nevada in 2006 uh while uh, during a ufo convention lots of the ufo convention uh, that used to be in uh, laughlin and now it's back in Laughlin, but before it was in, in Laughlin. And um, they approached me and asked me if I would do an interview with them uh, that uh, Mark was, was, was thinking about doing a special for uh, uh, UK uh, television. They're both from the United Kingdom. And I said, well, uh, what do you want to talk about? And they told, they, they told me they, that several things about the, the subject of UFOs and the investigations I had done in the past, the Paul Benowitz incident, and several other things. So I agreed to an interview. Uh, they asked me for a release. I refused to provide a release. I said, no, I'm not going to provide any kind of a release because I don't want this. Uh, they had promised me that uh, what I said, the, all my answers during the interview would be 
strictly confidential and they would uh, approach me at some later time uh, if they uh, wanted me, my interview, in, into their special or their, their television movie. I said, sure. Okay, so we did that. They asked me a lot of questions. I answered them. Uh, there were, I think, three sessions total uh, there at Laughlin. And, um, and then uh, a few weeks after the convention was over with, they uh, came to Albuquerque. They asked me to meet with them there. I did. I actually uh, got them on to Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, and um, uh, I was still in reserves at that time, so I, I was able to access the base. And um, I uh, showed them a, f a few things around the base, and, uh, and that was it. I didn't hear from the, them again until a, a person... Uh, familiar with the, the, the book uh, that he, he was going to write and, and familiar with the movie had called me and said, you know that you're in a movie that uh, Mark made uh, regarding those interviews. And I said, well, I never authorized any kind of uh, book or I didn't authorize it. I never signed a release. So this person interfaced with John and Mark. John kind of got out of it. John said, I'm not going to get involved in this because I, I don't want to get in trouble. And so, but Mark continued on with a guy by the name of Sheffield. Uh, I'm not sure what Sheffield's first name was, but he was, uh, I believe the producer or, or, or some had some kind of role in an English production company. Anyway, um, Mark finally uh, uh, called me and said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you release. Uh, you, I'll agree to pay you so much money. And, uh, I, I, and at, at that point it was only the book. There wasn't any mention of a, a of a movie. It was just the book. I said, what well, I'd want to read the manuscript first. He said, okay. So he sent me a, uh, a release in a, in a, in a, um, contract that called for me getting a thousand dollars. And I, I, I declined it. I said, I'm not going to get, you know, I, you owe me a lot more than that thousand dollars. <laughs> That's not a lot of money. And, no. And anyways, I, I, I got an attorney involved in it and they, they did another contract and the contract called for $17,500 uh, plus uh, so much for each copy and so forth. And they sent it to him. He, he, he called the attorney. I didn't talk to the attorney. Uh, he, uh, he, he didn't call me directly. He called my attorney and, and told my attorney it was agreeable and it would be all right. But then we, we never heard any more from him. And eventually the book was uh, published and then the movie, uh, I went back to my attorney, said, well, you know, I don't have any uh, uh, practicing rights in, in the UK, so you're gonna have to hire an attorney in the UK. I actually flew to the, the UK. I spoke to uh, one attorney, didn't want to do it. I was, it was, he was recommended to me. I went to him, he didn't want to do it. I went to another attorney. And he said, yeah, uh, Barster, they call him. And he said, um, there's, there's a lot of complications involved in this because part of this was negotiated in the United States. And now some of it's done here. I said, but the publication was done here. He said, yeah, but I'm not sure about it. I don't know if I can take the case. And then he asked me, he said, he called me, I went back to the States, he called me and he said, I'll do it, but I need a $10,000 retainer fee but I can't guarantee you anything. And I said, well, you know, so much for that. Anyways, the book was published, the movie was made, and uh, I'm stuck with, uh, stuck with that. The uh, book um, distorted uh, almost everything that I, I said during the interview. The movie, uh, a lot of the movie, and, and Mark on the phone readily admitted to me, he dubbed my voice in, he dubbed uh, words and phrases in on, on, the, on my interview, on, on all three of the interviews. And I said, why would the heck would you do that? And he said, well, I'm, I'm approaching this as a skeptic, and I can't allow a lot of this information to be one-sided. I, w I want it to be, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, I want, he wants it, wanted it to be one-sided. He said, I didn't want it to be uh in the type of manner that you presented it. And I said, well, I told the truth and I told you what 
I wanted I, well, what the truth was and what I wanted you to, to, to present to the public. He said, well, I'm sorry. And I hung up and changed his number and I've, I've never talked to him since. So uh, it's a negative, a lot of it's negative. There's a bit, a, a little bit of it that's uh, truthful. Uh, but how he tried to distort the uh, disinformation campaign uh, was absolutely wrong. Uh, and how we distorted the Paul Benowitz incident. And, uh, and so um, I came away from it with a very, very negative view of the Mirage Man, and, of the movie and the book. So did they actually use your voice or, and dub it into the movie or did they just take, um, did they take parts of your voice and put them out of context or did they, did they use, use another voice, somebody else's voice? Well, it was pretty tricky because we had, we had, uh, other than the interview, we, we spent a lot of time together, just walking around, uh, talking about different subjects. He, he'd ask me a, a, a number of questions about things. So what my interpretation of a certain event was, and, but he recorded it all. And I didn't know he recorded it. We actually sat in a bar one night and, uh, he, uh, the, there was a, there was a band on stage. We were, we were, we were sitting all the way in the back of the, of the club, but, uh, you could still hear the music. Uh, and he asked me all these really kind of strange questions. I didn't, you know, I, I, I just didn't realize that he was recording it and, and what his uh, intentions were later. So he used a lot of that, a lot of those uh, interviews, a lot of those uh, uh, questions and answers between the two of us. And he dubbed those, my responses into my, in, into the interview uh, in the book, um, in the movie. And they're distorted, totally distorted some of the stuff. So um, that's, uh, he was a very deceitful person. Um, I've, I've uh, sent him letters. I've, uh, I've confronted him uh, on, 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 on social media and he just, uh, he just refuses to. And now recently he's, he's made contact with another person who told them, he told the other person that he, there wasn't any contract and I was never promised any money. Not anybody with common sense could figure out that I, you know, you, you wouldn't do something like that without, no. without being paid. Yeah. So, so, so they, now that's what, he's, uh, that's what he's saying now. They did a lot behind your back and I guess a thousand dollars was really just a slap in the face. So how did you go back in negotiations with them in, in good faith? Well, my attorney did, and, and we came up with a $17,500 fee plus. I think it was so much a book. I can't remember uh, uh, what, what it was. but um, And I thought that was uh, um, reasonable, considering I should have gotten a lot more. Uh, but he refused. He never never made any offers or, or, or never agreed to a con- the, that contract. Did you know, and, did um, you know at that time that he was going to do a movie or I'm sorry, a book and a movie, or did you just think initially it was just a book? No. Well, in, um, uh, in Laughlin, he only spoke about the movie, kind of a documentary. Gotcha. And he, he had talked about him having some contacts with a production company in the UK and also one in, um, uh, Scotland and the one in, I believe it was, uh, uh, Ireland. Anyways, he had, he had contact cause he had done one before and he wanted to do a doc special and he was hoping he tried to, that maybe the history channel or the uh, uh, discovery or, or uh, channel would become involved in it. Uh, but, um, he, he wasn't sure at that point. And that, he only spoke of the movie or the documentary then. But when I spoke to him again, the, the second time in Albuquerque, uh, he came in Albuquerque twice. There was two different occasions in Albuquerque. The second time he, he talked about a book. He said, and it was always we, you know, we could write a book. We could do this. We could do that. We could make a lot of money on this. We could do this. But it was never we. It was only him. And John, uh, his, uh, his uh, partner, he, he, uh, John, uh, put up a, a lot of money. I, I can't remember how many pounds it was. And, uh, he was never paid back either. 
So did you ever feel now they're negotiating it and they're doing things internationally. So they're, they're, they're in the UK and um, you're in the United States, which, which makes things a little trickier. Did you ever think that they um, did that on purpose and used all that red tape as, as kind of a, a bargaining tool that would definitely favor them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, a, it was, a, it was a, uh, done all in, uh, in their, uh, their ring, so to speak, and uh, they didn't want anybody else to become involved, and they knew that they had some protection. Even attorney, one of the, the uh, second attorney I spoke to in the in, uh, UK, he told me, he said, you know, this is a, kind of a touchy matter. You, you know, you could sue in the United States, and, and you could go through, or you could go through an international court, uh, but, um, you know, if you get a judgment in the United States, it's not going to be valid in the UK. If you get a judgment in the UK, he could, he had, he had, uh, uh, a place in Switzerland too, uh, or, a, or, or some relative that lived in, lived in Switzerland that he'd spent a lot of time at. <clears throat> in fact, he, at one point when, we, when I met him in Albuquerque, he invited me to Switzerland, but, and it was just a complicated mess. Uh, and, and, and uh, th- there has been some, uh, a movement um, uh, since then, in, in the last 13 years, to prevent some of these things from happening. But uh, at that time, in 2006, there wasn't any uh, a, a, any agreement, any uh, agreement between the United States and UK or or with any other countries. So you could you could uh, swindle a person out of money by uh, including them in a book. And or or interviewing them and then putting them on their face on a on a special and get away with it. But uh, and ultimately, it, it, you're <laughs> ultimately you're just going to have to give in, you know, because you're going to pour as much money as you possibly can or want to, and um, basically they can just kind of sit back and and watch this thing unfold and and wait you out possibly. Exactly. So. Um, I, uh, I kind of got taken on that one. <laughs> so what was the final agreement then that actually put that movie, well, listen, I, movie on the screen? I never, I never got a penny. Wow. It wasn't any, I, I never received a penny. Uh, even though I was promised money, uh, I was promised money on the, on the, on the interview, promised money on the book. I never received a penny. I think, you know, that's, that's tough, but I, 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 I like the movie. <clears throat> and I, I think you look good in it. And one of the things that I see with you is, is this 100% confidence in your ability to remember all the events um, and, and remember them with, with vivid detail. So did your military career ever become confusing where you just had to stop yourself and say, wait a minute, because there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we only get to see a glimpse into your life, but um, so much went on and it just seemed so confusing. Did you just have to ever stop and just reorganize from time to time to, to make sure that, uh, everything you were doing was, was, um, on the up and up and, and a legitimate purpose that would, that would, um, benefit the, the United States and yourself in some way. Well, I'm a very strong willed person. Um, I, uh, uh, I've been through a lot before and, um, my, my family was, uh, all military. I brought up with a, in a strict military family. My father was in the Air Force, and uh, my uncle was in the Air Force, and so I, I was very strong-willed. When I uh, when I went into regular Air Force, um, I did some very interesting things, and then when I went into OSI, now OSI isn't actually military. It's a, it's something similar to. NCIS, or uh, you see on TV, NCIS, uh, they're civilian uh, personnel assigned to a military unit. So see, the uh, uh, AFOSI, I know I was categorized as being a sergeant. I was never a sergeant in AFOSI. I was a special agent, and there are different categories of special agents. So, um, but when I started the career as, as in OSI in 1978, uh, I had... Uh, no idea that I was going to get involved in the subject of UFOs. I had known nothing about UFOs prior to that. How old, uh, how even, old were you in 1978? In 1978, I was 25 uh, years old. 
So it's a pretty big deal to do this at 25 years old or any age. Well, I was, yeah, I was in college. I got out, got this job. Uh, again, I was, I, I was, I'd been in some things in the regular Air Force that uh, I was, you know, that had put some strain on me and put me in stressful situations. I knew it could handle it. And, and, and OSI was a very, very, very tough uh, agency to, to get into, uh, about only 10, 10% of, of everyone, of the people that applied actually get a job. I mean, there's a, there's a, a whole whirlwind of, of, uh, uh, pre-employment and, 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 uh, application process and, and physical fitness and all these things you had to pass to get in, you get in. And of course the psychological evaluation and a polygraph, you had to take a polygraph to get in. And once you get, once I got in, uh, I was, uh, I went to the, uh, the, the OSI Academy, which is in, uh, which at back then was in the Forstall building in Washington, DC. That's where the department of energy was located. But the OSI Academy was in that building. Went through that. And then I was immediately placed in, uh, counterintelligence. Uh, then I went to, uh, uh, the CIA counterintelligence counterespionage course. And then a short course later through DIA, that's intelligence agency. But again, there wasn't any mention of UFOs during any of my training and that training. Uh, the only, the only thing that was ever mentioned was that we did, the OSI conducted some special investigations into highly classified projects. That's, that's, that was kind of a, a catch all, uh, thing, a catch all. Uh, type of investigations that we could we could become involved with, and that's and, and that's what they they told us. And so when I got to Kirtland, which was my first assignment, Kirtland Air Force Base, I was assigned to the District 17 office and in, in, in the counterintelligence division. Um, I had about I was there about uh, four or five months when I my 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 boss. Uh, told me that I would, I was going to be briefed into a special projects program. Do you feel that they were, they were grooming you the whole time for this or did it just suddenly become this after a certain period of time? No, I, I kind of hate to say, even mention that, but, uh, my father was a Colonel and, in the Air Force and he was still in and <laughs> he had some friends and my dad was in intelligence the entire, his entire career, Other, not, not entire, because let me correct myself. He was in Korea uh, as a pilot. He went into the Air Force as a pilot, right out of Amherst College in Massachusetts. He went to flight training school. I mean, anyways, he was a pilot in, a, in uh, the B, B-26s. And he was shot down over uh, Korea, but he was fortunate enough to be rescued by a Greek army unit and, uh, he never flew again. He went immediately and after his wound sealed, he went into intelligence and my dad spent the next 28 years or so of his career in intelligence. So he, he spent entire time in intelligence and I knew that and I knew a lot of his friends. And so I think, although no one's ever actually, uh, uh, stated this to my face, but I think, they were grooming me. I think there was a somebody uh, that said, you know, I think uh, he needs to follow in his dad's footsteps. And so I think, and I can't ever be positive about this, but my feelings is that, yeah, I was groomed. I was briefed into a program. Uh, the first program I was briefed into, um, it was, it, it mentioned um, exotic technology I didn't actually say extraterrestrials, but when I uh, became involved with the Paul Benowitz incident, I was briefed into the second program. That was Project Aquarius program, which gave the full history of the United States involvement, beginning with the Roswell crash. And then mentioning some of the other crashes and the contacts we'd had with extraterrestrials. Uh, so that, astounded me that uh, made me uh wonder uh i mean i i remember the briefing when i got the briefing was on the west side of kirtland air force base at the air force special security office 
uh, briefing lasted probably an hour and a half done by a, it was done by a colonel. There were six of us in a room. Uh, and I got in my OSI car and I had to drive across the base to the east side of the base because that's where the OSI office was located. I remember driving thinking of what I just was uh, had access to. I was just briefed on and I actually pulled over to the side of the road and, and parked in a little parking area uh, right next to a jogging park. And uh, I sat there for probably 20 minutes trying to grasp what I just had heard, not understanding it. I mean, sitting there thinking, this is real? <laughs> you know, we really, I mean, this is for real. I ne- I'd never heard of the Roswell incident, even though my dad had been stationed at Roswell. I, 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 I had no idea. I mean, I, my brother was the one that believed in the UFOs. He read the True magazines back in the, in the 60s. And, but me, I, I just didn't, I just, I never had any uh, any uh, interest in it, and here I am now being briefed into the program, thinking, "My God, this stuff is real. It, it is hard to believe. It is. It is. I mean, it's like, is it, you know, and you always question, like, why did they just give me this briefing? And is it for real, or is it some kind of game they're playing? I mean, all these things go through your mind. Well, I find out later, it's, there's no game involved. It's fact. All of, during my 11 year career, I mean, I learned that it was fact. I mean, everything that they told me was, in fact, true. And then that's when I started the uh, Paul Benowitz uh, case and, and handled that for a number of years. And there was several other cases involving UFOs and, and ET contacts and so forth I handled at Kirtland during that time, too. I think when, um, you know, we have a lot of believers out there. Now, you have varying degrees of belief. Um, you have people that uh, you, it could be any, any, any matter of, 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 of amount of belief, but when you're actually hit with, the, with the, the cold, hard data that you had to look at, what was that like? What was that initial shock like that, yeah, this stuff exists and it's bigger than you could possibly imagine? What was that like? It was stunning. Uh, the fact that you, I had no um, pre-conditioning uh, for it. I mean, we sit in a room. You really don't know what the briefing is going to be. Uh, and and I'll, the first part of the briefing was a film. He showed uh, a, the film of the recovery uh, of the Roswell. And, and it, the film was an old film. I think it was, a, was a 16 millimeter, I believe, back in those days. And he didn't say anything. He just, he just showed the movie. And it was about 30 minutes or something to that effect, roughly 30 minutes. And then after it was over with, he looked, he looked at everyone in the, in the class, there's six of us. And he, he said, well, what do you think of that? And hmm. we thought, well, is it, is it a movie that the Air Force made or is it, whoa, what is this? And, he, and then that's when he said, everything you saw in that movie is fact. And then he went into the briefing in 1947. Uh, two crafts crashed, crashed over to Mexico, and he went on and, and, and gave us that entire briefing. Well, it was stunning. I mean, you're sitting there thinking, my God, I'd never heard of this. Are we, we re- really? I mean, I'd seen movies about UFOs when I was kids and so forth, but I said, well, this is real. This is for, I said, saying to myself, this is for real. And then there was a question and, and answer period later after it was over with, and, there, you know, you hear the questions. And, and some of these people that were asking questions, you could tell they were questioning whether this, what we had just heard or, and what we had just seen is in, in fact real or is, it, is are we involved in some kind of psychological game? Right. And he assured us, he said, I guarantee you, this is no psychological game. What you've just heard and seen is absolutely fact. I would, I, let, learn, me, let me say this really quick that yeah. I would think that, uh, you know, um, if, if there's you and a few people in that room, I mean, learning this would, would change your look outlook on everything, you know? And, um, if, if, if this happened to me, it would change my outlook on everything. If it happened to the general population of the United States at any given time, it would change most people's outlook on everything. So was that the point? Yes. Yes. And it, and it does. It does change you, especially some of the very, very um, highly classified 
and highly sensitive information that you learned uh, that had occurred and what we learned from the uh, even one, the alien that survived the, the Roswell crash, the Corona crash, and it, the government, uh, the public's calling it Roswell, but actually the government calls it the Corona crash because it, it actually crashed uh, not far from Corona, New Mexico, not Roswell. It's quite a ways from Roswell. But the Brazil Ranch is far north of Roswell, and his land extended up towards Corona. So, uh, you know, the books, uh, going back to Berlitz and Moore's book in 79 and 80, they coined it the Roswell crash. But, you know, in actuality, it could be the Corona and Magdalena crash or Horse Mesa crash. There's a second craft that landed way out there. But, but yeah, it, and there's, there's things that we learned from the even that is kind of shocking. I mean, when you're told that this particular civilization is thousands of years more advanced than you are, and they've been visiting us for about 2,000 years, you start thinking, what was Jesus? <laughs> was Jesus one of them? You know, I mean, it, it doesn't say that. I mean, nobody has ever, ever told me that. But you start thinking about that thinking about well, 2,000 years ago, that's about, you know, what, you know, is Jesus involved? Right. Was he a space man? And then, and, and so you, you, you question, start questioning all these things. And, uh, and then there's a lot of things that I, that, that you learn, uh, that are, are subject to, uh, uh, really, uh, contemplating what it means when you hear about something that had occurred or something that they had done, the ETs, and then you think to yourself, how has ha, that affected uh, Earth life? You know, and, and you start thinking all sorts of things. And then one thing you also learn is that, and he tells you this right, right off the bat, you're only learning the basic stuff. This is a basic briefing. So everything's compartmented in the military and in the government and intelligence community. And I learned over the years that I only knew probably – 10 or 15 percent there's and I don't know that there's anyone uh, maybe a few people that know it all but there's so much that I learned later on that wasn't part of the briefing that I learned that that we were we were doing and uh, and uh, th that the aliens provided to us or or, or the threats uh, I always tell people uh, they want to know it all. I want to know it all. I, 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 I always say to them, and I don't want to be dramatic or uh, uh, about, with a statement, but be careful what you ask for. Because if you if you, if you if you sit down and know it all, hmm. it, you might be not the same forever in your life. Right. At any time, uh, did any of this initially frighten you? Oh, yes. I'm not the type of guy, you know, and again, I don't want to break, but I'm not the type of guy that scares easy. But I guarantee you there are some things that I was subjected to and there was some, some, some other incidents I was involved in that scared the dickens out of me. Yes, it definitely did, did scare me. Do they have, and, in uh, the, in, does the military have a way of dealing with that? Because I don't care who you are. I mean, you were hit with something huge. And ultimately, that's going to change your behavior in, in, in some way. I mean, whether it be positive or negative, do they have a way of dealing with that shock? Well, in order to get an in intelligence, you have to go through a lot of really uh, 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 tough training and psychological uh, evaluations and, and so forth, testing. And, and so you should be... Uh, they weed out the people that probably couldn't grasp it, but you know, you're only a human being. So I, I, there was never any counselors, but my boss, uh, one of my bosses who had been briefed in a program and actually had worked in the program for, uh, 12 years prior to me being briefed into, he, he pulled me aside once we went into a secure room and he sat down and he said, is any of this too much? Is there anything hmm. here that you're doing that maybe you can't handle? And, you know, I, I said, absolutely not. I can handle it all. I just, it's, uh, I think about it a lot. I mean, you, you have to think that, you know, what else do we know 
that I don't know. And what does the government know that I don't know? And he, he knew a lot more. He said, well, if you ever get briefed in all of it, you may, you'll never be the same. He told me that, as a, as the colonel had said that earlier. And I said, well, I don't know if I want to know it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, uh, I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> wow. So did they ever give you, uh, initially, right away, did they give you uh, what your objective would be, or did that wait? No. The, 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 there were 122 uh, counter uh, t- intelligence officers throughout the United States that was investigating and handling all these incidents. I wasn't the only one. Was, there, was, there, was, there was three of us at the Kirtland and then they were, they were scattered all over the United States, the other ones. And they all had been briefed and they're all working on that uh, and, and what, what I was working on. And I was going to be investigating every case, uh, legitimate case of of uh, UFO sightings by military personnel over a military installation or involving military aircraft or any other special projects that I was assigned to. And that's, that was what I was briefed on. And that's what I did. I, um, the Paul Benowitz case was very, very complicated, involved a lot of different aspects that, uh, that, that, that I did brief uh, when I did the uh, UFO uh, Megacon in Laughlin in March, I, I gave a, uh, you know, a 80 minute briefing uh, on that and presentation on that Paul Benowitz case. So, and there was a lot of things that people never knew before that I brought up that was, uh, had been classified, but is, I don't think classified anymore. I was signed to a security pledge and that's long gone. So I guess uh, I'll take the heat for it. I, I'm talking about it and I haven't been. Um, so they initially, they, they initially told you that you're going to be investigating UFOs and um, how they related to uh, uh, air force and air force property. So right then, I mean, you had to say to yourself, wow, these things are interacting with the air force and, and we're going to be involved with cases that involve the air force. But what about, civilian cases did you have any involvement in that at all i mean other than paul benowitz who kind of became involved with you later well paul benowitz his case involved the military involved the 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 air force base uh so that's how we were connected to it and so we we were authorized to to investigate that case there there were some other cases that involved strictly uh, civilian sightings that were of, uh, of a, of a big magnitude and that was legitimate, uh, uh, UFO sighting. Now we didn't, we didn't take reports of people that saw a flashing light out in the sky or, or something to that effect that were civilian, strictly civilian. We didn't, we didn't handle any of that. We would, um, we would suggest we contact MUFON or app pro or some, somebody else. We, we weren't interested in those cases. We were interested in cases that involved uh, legitimate sightings of unknown crafts. And a lot of these unknown crafts that the civilians were reporting was an actually was actually some kind of an Air Force or military experimental aircraft. And that's how we got connected to that. Uh, we, we, we found a flight. We, uh, somebody reported something extraordinary to us. And we would go ahead and look into it and find out that during a particular, that, that particular time period, over that particular place, there was, in fact, a highly classified aircraft flying and doing maneuvers or doing some kind of testing. Or, uh, and, and then we relay that, okay, yeah, in fact, that is you know, Air Force connected, military connected. And then we would go back and tell the person, geez, I don't know. We don't know what it is. Uh, you, you probably just saw a real UFO. Uh, we don't have any answer for you. And we just leave it at that. Let them decide on their own. But when we knew what it was, uh, you know, we would be content with that. Now, there were some cases where somebody reported something. And we knew there wasn't any military aircraft flying in that area. And they had some kind of verifying data or, or evidence, such as a photograph. And we would take the photograph and tell them, hey, you know, we're going to look at this photograph because you know, I don't know what it is. And uh, truly, we didn't know what it was. And I 
set it off and have it analyzed. And, and sometimes I'd get something back and other times I wouldn't get anything back. Uh, so, um, when, when project blue book closed in 1969 after the condom report, the, the air force wanted to get rid of this, this matter. Although they were, they still knew they had to investigate and keep investigating it. So they, they, they asked, other agencies if they wanted to be the clearinghouse for it and DIA, which was relatively new, they came in existence in 1961. So they were about eight or nine years old. DIA put their hand up and said, Hey, we'll take it. So then all the, all these reports went through the air force to DIA for storing after that. And then, but we still, uh, the air force still had a number of, uh, special agents or intelligence officers that were investigating these things even after 1969. And I am a classical example of one of them myself and others who came forward saying, yeah, we did it. Um, and so it proved that the air force was still interested in the subject, but, but, but the charter was we, we would investigate it if it involved an air force person, if it involved an air force aircraft, if it involved Air Force, any other Air Force property, it was occurred on or near an Air Force installation, or if it was some kind of a direct threat to national security. That was our target. You investigated these cases and you knew your objective. Did you, um, it's kind of a long question, but did you have limitations? Was there a budget? Um, you had a problem and a strategy to deal with it and a result? What could you do and what couldn't you do? Well, what we do is that once we get a complaint, and we call it a complaint or, or, or information presented to us, we do an Air Force, uh, Air Force I Form 1, which is a, it's called a complaint form. Or we had another form. It was a DIA Form 16 that involved, uh, it, was, it was real highly classified. We'd fill it out on that. And we'd send it up. We wouldn't do anything initially. We sent it up to our chain of command, which went through uh, uh, headquarters Air Force and over to DIA. And then we'd wait for permission to come back down through the channels. And once we got permission, it would dictate what we what they wanted us to do, and what what our what our um, uh, objective was, and what our limitations were. And we would have a budget. Uh, and, 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 and I tell you. Uh, we never ran out of money. I don't know where the money <laughs> came from, but, but if we had to do something, we had to buy something. Uh, we, we had a particular, well, the Paul Benwith case, we rented, um, you know, I don't know what the final dollar amount uh, was in that five-year investigation, but it, it must have been close to two hundred to $300,000. You rented, I mean, the, you rented the house across the street, right? Or, or somewhere near him? No, we, we didn't, we didn't rent that house. We rented another house. The, the house across the street ought to have been rented. That was another, that's another story. We rented a house behind, on the other side of him. We rent, we actually we rented two houses. We rented one house. We set up all the equipment and we found out that the particular house we were into, I didn't have a good vantage point. Our technical uh, agent said, you know what? We need that house over there. So we actually uh, were able to rent this house from another person, the second ho the house we rented. So we rented actually two houses. And I, and it was, you know, it, we're talking back in the early 80s, and it was, you know, seven dollars $800 a month, I think, something to that effect. And we were, I mean, we were paying it. And it wasn't out of, the, the intelligence community didn't operate out of any kind of uh, purchase order, or purchase request, where you get a the government check. We, we, we had our own we call it confidential funds. We'd pay him out of a bank, a local Albuquerque bank. Uh, I think it was a, the, the, the bank of Albuquerque we, we would use. The money would be deposited in the bank. And I don't know who deposited it. Somebody did. And then we would write the checks out of, of that. Sometimes we'd go to the bank and get a draft. Sometimes when we needed cash, we'd go down and, and to the bank and get, get the cash advance. I mean, that's, that's how it worked in the intelligence community. It wasn't the Air Force that some pay officer wrote a check and gave it to that person. So that person that we're renting this house from only knows that we're giving them under a 
uh, uh, identity of a, uh, we used a couple different cover uh, companies, one particular contractor, uh, uh, general contractor, and a, one, another under a, a electrical supply company. So we were covered. Everything was covered. These people were getting their money. They didn't really care where it came from. How hard is it to cover up a legitimate UFO case observed by a group or more than one person? That involved the Air no, Force. I I uh, I had one case once of a um, this, well, this is actually uh, involved Civil Air Patrol, uh, which is a, a entity of the of the United States Air Force, a civilian entity. It, uh, there there are some uh, military, but most of the military are retirees that are are working for Civil Air Patrol, but. There was a uh, Civil Air Patrol exercise where they had five or six planes up flying around, and uh, they had Civil Air Patrol, which are m- most of the ones in this particular case were within probably between uh, you know eighteen and twenty year olds, some some age range. That's about the injury. Maybe maybe a little bit younger. And then there was always a pilot. Uh, the pilot was uh, a, a retired Air Force pilot. Or, maybe sometimes active duty, but most of the time retired. And they were flying a formation. There was six Cessna uh, 180s flying north in northern New Mexico. And they uh, spotted this uh, UFO, which they, uh, there were, I think, 11, 11 or 12 people in the plane, those five planes, I think, that saw it. Uh, the UFO uh, was uh, made some uncharacteristic, uh, maneuvers. Uh, it flew real close to one particular airplane, uh, and uh, so the plane the planes landed in Kirtland, and I what the one of the pilot uh, it immediately called the OSI and reported it to us, and myself and another agent went out there and sat down with the group, all of them in one particular part of the hangar, uh, in the pilot debriefing room. And, and they told us what they, they saw, and they're all excited. Well, some pictures were taken, but they were on 35 millimeters, so we, they, they hadn't been developed yet. And we said, well, we'll take the cameras, we'll do, develop them, we'll give them back to you, and, and just uh, and, and give you the camera back and explain what, what, what you saw. So we went back, and we have our own uh, photo lab and we developed them and well, lo and behold, they weren't anything that we, uh, as I said earlier, uh, about something that was observed that we didn't know about. There wasn't any testing. This wasn't an Air Force or, a, or some other military um, uh, test vehicle. This was, a, in fact, a true uh, ET craft. Uh, it, it, and it, the characteristics and, and some of these pictures were extraordinary. I mean, I can't believe that these uh, 16 or, or eight, 17, 18 year olds were taking these fantastic pictures. I mean, they had to half stop just, pr- I mean, they really <laughs> did, did, made, did some fantastic pictures. They, Unfortunately, they, they, never took, got them back. They, they took photo in high school. That's, they, well, the, I did, I did the yeah, same yeah. thing. Okay. Okay. They knew what to do. To <laughs> yeah, them. Absolutely. And anyways, when, when I get the report back from headquarters, uh, number one, they weren't going to get the photos back. And to tell them what they saw was, in fact, a uh, Air Force test vehicle. And so, I, I, I think I couldn't get them all together at one time, but eventually I, I briefed all of them that that what they saw was an Air Force test vehicle. I could buy it. And that. I think, and I think most of them accepted it. I mean, the way I presented it, uh, the one the one person that didn't was uh, the it was a, re, a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel. Uh, he flew, flew uh, uh, F-106s and flew in Vietnam, F-4s, and and he'd seen a lot of things. And he was a, a smart old little guy. And, he, you know, he, he, the kids bought it and left. And the, the retired colonel came up to me and he said, uh, you know what? You can tell them whatever you want. You can blow smoke up their skirts and pants, but I'm not buying it. <laughs> and I said, well, Colonel, I, all I can tell you is what what I was told. He said, I understand. No, I understand. He said, but that wasn't any of our, of our experimental crafts. That wasn't anything 
that, that could it ha- had to defy gravity, and we don't have anything that can do that. He said, I've been retired for a few years, but I can tell you that that wasn't one of ours. And I just let, the, let it go with that. I was like, are you with him? I said, well, sir, you, know, you have a right to believe in whatever you want to believe. I never heard any more about things from him about it, or it was never in a newspaper or anything like that. So let's say so you have that, a that, let's let's say you have a scenario with a huge complaint. Now you called it a complaint. So what's the response like? Is there multiple black vehicles and personnel, or you know, trying to control damage, or is it just you and maybe a, a couple of other people that do the same job you are? I'm not sure of the question. Try that again. Well, if if you have a complaint or if you have a situation where um, you know you have a again you have a, a sighting by multiple people um what's the response time like are you right there and is there multiple are you driving you know is it is it is it a huge dramatic presence that you show up in multiple vehicles or is it do you try to keep it subtle and try to keep it you know downplay it a bit well it depends on the time frame involved most of what we we get is uh, after the fact it's uh uh, you know time sometimes uh, a day or two and sometimes a week and you know, sometimes even longer than that. If it's but if it's current, if it's something that it was happening right then, uh, and there was an incident, uh, one that sticks in my mind was south of the base. Um, they were uh, we had the Kirtland Air Force Base trained pararescue personnel, and there was a lot of helicopters that flew out south of the base. Was a, there was a training area. And these, uh, and this is all Air Force people. There wasn't any civilians involved in this, but the but these people claim they claimed this craft came in, flew right over their top of their helicopter, which they were flying a CH-53 helicopter, and there was five pure rescue guys in on the, uh, in the in the aircraft, a uh, two uh, pilot and co-pilot, two crew, uh, three crew members, and a flight engineer, and so there were um, eight people that saw this, and and the, the helicopter landed immediately. This craft flew over towards the side of a mountain and landed, which w- would have been on the base. We were immediately notified. And I, actually, myself and this other uh, agent, we were not more than a couple miles away. We were on another uh, case. We were interviewing some people. We get the call uh, on our uh, on the radio. And uh, and so we, uh, the, the radio in the vehicle, the two-way radio, and we immediately responded out there. So we got there. This is the only time that I can remember we got there within probably 20, 25 minutes of the sighting. And these, uh, I mean, the crew members, I mean, this pilot and co-pilot, they're both you know, Vietnam veterans and the peer, the peer rescue guys. Most of them were trainees. There was a, a, um, a, a senior sergeant who was a trainer and uh, he'd been around, and they were all shook and shaken up. I mean, they were really noticeably shaken. And the colonel, the lieutenant colonel, the, the, the command pilot told me, he said, the thing landed over there against that mountain. He said, and, there, and where he was pointing to was the U.S. Geological Survey uh, Station that's over there. I said, okay, yeah, we'll go over and check it out. So we drove over there. And myself and the other agent, and we couldn't find anything. We drove. We had a jeep. So we were in a actually CJ seven jeep, and we drove up this really bad road and up and around, and we searched the whole area. We we didn't see anything. Well, when we went back to interview him to get more statements from him, they gave us more precise location of where it landed. And actually, it came from another helicopter that had seen it and actually flew over towards where it landed. The helicopter, the crew I was talking to, they landed immediately. This other crew, Air Force, because there was five other aircraft, uh, helicopters up, he flew over, and it was just him, and the, uh, the pilot, co-pilot, and the flight engineer, and flew right over this thing. He said it was all black and it was sitting on the ground, and, and he showed us. So we actually had to leave the base and go out and then come back in order to get to it because there wasn't any roads to where he, when we got over there, there was, it was a, it was a landing site. We saw marks, we saw black spots and then we treated it as an actual landing and we processed it in accordance with that. But uh, the craft was obviously gone, but something had landed there. I have a person who 
well, I once knew, and I have spoken extensive, extensively about uh, government cover-ups, and he has first-hand knowledge, but really won't go on record. And I once asked him about the possibility that our government was covering up the the UFO alien phenomena and and with dif- disinformation and deception. And and he said to me once, and I wrote this down: um, sometimes it's too easy. Deception doesn't have to be convincing. It just has to have enough layers so it's incontrovertible without being confirmable, which is a good quote. Is that true? Absolutely. That's right out of the manual. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever told you that? Whoever told you that has some knowledge of, of counterintelligence. Right. We don't call it information. We call it counterintelligence. Right. Counterintelligence operation. And sometimes, like Paul Benowitz, classical case, we didn't have to convince him of anything. He was thoroughly convinced on his own. He wouldn't let us influence him in any way. He said, I know they're aliens. I know these are hostile crafts. And I know you, I don't want you to, he always said, insult my intelligence by telling me, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. And so we didn't. We just let him believe what he wanted to believe because he, he was believing they were all UFOs. And in fact, most of what he was seeing was in fact classified drones. Back then the drones were being tested. And there wasn't any uh, unclassified drones back in those days. They were all highly classified. And what he was seeing were drones. And uh, we didn't have to convince him. Any. He, he, he said there were UFOs, so okay. <laughs> well, I'm not going to argue with you. So how deep does it go, and, and are the layers endless until the situation is, is essentially buried? Yes. Yes. It's, it's a uh, very complex system. It starts with a, a counterintelligence network that you develop, including uh, local news media, local um, uh, uh, watch, uh, we call them uh, local intelligence watch personnel, who watches out uh, for uh, strange things happening around the base. And we get the reports. Uh, there, we, we, we penetrated, uh, I, I haven't spoke, uh, speak, I can speak for the uh, our, my job at Kirtland, but we uh, had developed sources of information in all the local television and uh, news media. We had a source of information that would tell us immediately what they when they got something. So we were able to um, sometimes convince and sometimes not. Uh, sometimes we could influence what they aired, and sometimes we we couldn't. I mean, the, it was it was a what we call a gentleman's agreement. Basically, is that you know they told us what they had, and we tell them you know what well, I don't think you should report that because it could be highly classified. And nine times out of ten, I mean I should say about seven times out of ten, they wouldn't report it. The other couple times they they would report it, but they would cover it up, and so so to speak. It'd be one time report. They they say we were going to report it one time on the on the six o'clock news, but it's not going to be on the 10 o'clock or we'll report it on the 10 o'clock and we won't report it again. There's something to that effect. We'd have some kind of agreement with them. Might we and assume, then there would, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And that. then we'd have uh, people that lived around the base that we would uh, recruit. And most of these people are retirees who would love to get involved. I mean, they're retired. They're not doing anything. And we tell them, hey, we want you to look out. We, you know, there may be terrorists there may be spies. Uh, I mean, it might be strange things flying around us, guys. We need you as our eyes out here. And, you know, they were the best of the best of the best. And so they were to report back to us on strange things occurring. So we had a net, intelligence net set up around the base. And that's every single base, uh, not just Air Force, but the Army and the Navy did the same thing. And they set up this really complicated network. And we get information flowing back to us. Now, you know, 80% of the information we're getting is just crap. Nothing, and there's nothing to it. Uh, they're seeing Mars or they're seeing aircraft taken off from the, the runway or they're, they're seeing uh, a plane flying without their lights or something to that effect. And so, but, but there are, there was the other 20% that was what we investigated and what we became involved with. Because what we do is we get a we get a report, hey, uh, south of the base or, or east of the base or north of the base or uh, we uh, some one of our 
assets outside the base would report there was an object here and there and this and or somebody would come to the come to us and report something. We check with our sources outside the base and they confirm it. Yeah, there was this black object that was above us. And it flew over here and it flew over there and it didn't have any navigation lights. Ah, you know, okay, great. Uh, so then we'd start checking into it. Now that's a threat, could be a threat to the base. And so we'd check into it. We'd go through the classified reporting system. We'd check with uh, Debt 3, which was Mary 51. You got anything flying out here? Yep. We had the uh, F-117 flying back in those days. It was just hmm. testing. Uh, yeah, we had an F-117 flying and a, a certain mission on this course, this vector. So so, so we check it all. Yeah, okay, it was a 117. Well, we weren't going to tell anybody it was a 117. Yeah, you, know, hey, you guys just saw your boat. Praise him for it. Oh, then, you know, okay, well, where was it doing? I don't know. Because I always tell people, if you see a, if you see something flying and it doesn't have, if it has lights flashing, it's probably not a UFO because the ETs don't fly with FAA approved <laughs> navigation. Yeah, I agree with you that, but, with that for sure. But, but the F-117 and even some other experimental craft, they're flying without any lights because the military in combat areas or combat zones or in, 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 in uh, cross border flights, such as into the Soviet Union or into China, they're not going to put their lights on. So they turn them all off and they, and they can be done there. But most of the time in the States, unless it's some kind of really secret mission and they, they have to keep their uh, FAA navigation lights on. But there are times when they were testing the F-117 uh, and even the, the B-2 without the light. They were flying without light. And the most of the time in that, that a, a time frame, these black objects that were being seen were, and were in fact the 117, you know, the one of the B2. Might we assume uh, military cover up and disinformation programs go well uh, through all three branches of government? I know indirectly, but are all three branches briefed or is it a need to know scenario? I was never in the position to, to know that I, I, I've heard, uh, but I, I don't know for a fact. I, I know that what I did, I uh, went up the chain and, uh, and came back down. Now I'm, I, I've heard, uh, Harrison Schmidt, the late Harrison Schmidt, who's a Senator from New Mexico. I knew he, somebody had briefed him on some things. We have former master not. I know he, he knew a lot, uh, but there was a case that happened um, back in the early 80s, and he came, he couldn't get any information. One of his constituents came to him and said, this strange object landed, these little people came out, got out, walked around, took soil samples and so forth. Uh, they disabled our car and this and that. And, this. and and in fact, that happened. We investigated it. We, we did a really, 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 really deep investigation on that. And we got some extraordinary evidence. Well, they, they, the people that witnessed it and reported it was, uh, from New Mexico and they reported to Senator Schmidt. We wanted to know what, what it was. And so he had made some inquiries to the Air Force. The Air Force wouldn't tell him anything. He went over to the agency, CIA and the DIA, and they wouldn't tell him anything. So he came out to the base. He came out to our office. Uh, my, bo my boss uh, called me. Uh, my, my, our office was in, a, in, a, in the secure area of a building, so nobody could actually walk into our office. We, it had to come through a, a secure uh, portal, so to speak, and, and, and ask. And then we would escort him back, or we would come up and talk to him in another room. And he specifically asked for me. So I need to talk to Special Agent Richard Doty. And the clerk up front says, well, sir, you can, he said, I'm a senator, United States senator, and I want to talk to him. So she called me, and she said, there's a Senator Schmidt up here that wants to talk to you. And I said, okay. So I thought, well, maybe he maybe wants to report something. So I walked up, and he introduced himself, very polite, very nice, well-mannered man. 
He said, I need to talk to you and I need to be in a secure area when I do it. And I said, okay, sir. So, you know, being a U.S. senator and former astronaut, former military pilot, I gave him all the courtesies I could give him. We went back to this room, a secure room, went in there. I said, it's secure. He turned on the special anti-intrusion system. I said, what can I do for you? And then he asked me about this incident. He kind of put me in a corner, you know, because uh, he knew a lot. I mean, he knew a lot about it. I mean, he, he specifically gave details that the only somebody that had been there uh, would have known. And I didn't tell me that he got this from, from the witnesses. I said, well, did you? So I approached it in a different manner. I said, well, I started asking questions. When you get backed up, you start asking the questions. I said, well, where did you get this information? He said, well, I got it from the, one of the witnesses, one of the people that were there. And they reported it to you because they gave me your name. I said, okay, I know what you're talking about. I said, you know what, sir? We're still investigating it. He said, okay. And I said, it's a policy of the, of the, of the, of the government not to release any information on any type of case, whether it was a civil uh, or whether it was an intelligence case or a criminal case until the case is closed. I can't discuss anything. He said, and then he, he, then he was, you know, very polite. He said, I understand. I understand. He gives me his card. He gives me his, some uh, two secret phone numbers. He said, these aren't published. Please call me. He said, I don't want you to discuss anything. I know security limits and so forth over the phone, but I need to know who I need to know about this. I said, okay, sir. I will, I will, I will contact you. I said, you will either hear from me or from somebody else. I said, you got to understand that I have a chain of command that I have to follow and I have certain rules I have to follow. And he said, I fully understand that. He said, but if you can't answer it, maybe the Air Force, the Secretary of the Air Force can or the Inspector General. I go back a little bit. But I didn't, didn't operate within the same Air Force uh, system as, as other agencies. We were a direct reporting unit, meaning that we reported directly to the uh, 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 the uh, Inspector General of the United States Air Force. We didn't report to any local commanders or any colonels or anybody else. We went right up. So so we can't we couldn't be influenced by anybody. The Inspector General, and then he reported to Secretary of the Air Force, um, and that was the chain. So I told him, I said, well, somebody above me probably would. So I went and reported it. I sent a message up, uh, an immediate message all the way up the chain of command, and they told me they'll take care of it. And that was the last I heard from Senator Schmidt. Somebody briefed me. So somebody probably up there does brief him, but I I don't know who it would be. Was this twofold? Were you uh, throwing people off the UFO alien trail while blaming sightings of legitimate experimental aircraft on, on UFOs? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> uh, how, how would you even keep track of that? I mean, that's amazing to me because, I mean, you're, li- you're literally living two different lives at the same time. Well, you know, I, I don't want to take all the credit for it. <laughs> I don't want to take all the credit for it, but it was a very, very, very strictly controlled program. And when, when the, uh, when I set up a report, an initial report up, uh, I wouldn't do anything. And I, if there was information I was still gathering, I would, I could collect it. I could collect it. Witnesses or other information. I could still collect it, but I couldn't do any offensive. I could only be reactive until the plan comes down from, from DIA or, or the Air Force. That gives that gave me specific instructions on what to do and what not to do. So then from that point on, I had the authority to go out and get warrants or whatever I needed to do or get get a, a subpoena or, or, or anything like that or to go out and conduct uh, clandestine operations. Uh, but one of the things I tell people that there's, 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 People out there in the UFO community are as ignorant as can be, and as you probably know. And there's one particular guy that's always been a thorn in my side, Alejandro Rojas. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he he claims uh, he actually wrote a letter to the Air Force a few years ago saying I was a rogue 
person in. I went out and did all these things. And the Air Force actually sent me the letter with a, a very cryptic, uh, funny note on it. But um, everything I did, every single action, every single investigative step I did was sanctioned 100% by the United States government. I never, ever did anything that I wasn't sanctioned to do. Paul Benowitz has and come you, up a few times. To- go ahead, finish that. I want to go on. No, Paul. I'm just saying there's a lot of people out there saying, well, you went out and you disinformed these people. You committed a crime. Uh, you violated U.S. law. Right. Uh, well, how did they violate U.S. law? Tell me how I did. I had a very candid conversation with a guy out at UFO, uh, UFO um, Megacon in, in Laughlin in March about, oh, you, you went out and uh, made people crazy. Uh, you violated U.S. law. Well, what the U.S. law did they violate? Well, uh, you disinformed people. I said, show me in the United States code, anywhere in the United States code that that's against the law. No. <laughs> there says you know. and, and we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't. Now, there's another aspect to this whole program. Me, I'm talking me, Richard Doty. I'm not talking about anybody else. I didn't ever, uh, strong arm anyone, threaten anyone, pull a gun on anyone, although I carried a gun, uh, threaten them with, with, with crimes or threaten them to kill them or their families because they wouldn't cooperate. Never, ever happened. Now, did it happen within the intelligence community? Do I know cases where it happened? Absolutely. Wasn't me. I never did it. You talk about the men in black. We, there was a section uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., headed by a person I knew very well that did the dirty tricks. Now, if we were dealing with somebody that was obstinate or was totally uncooperative with us, uh, we just leave. You know, you can do whatever you want to, sir or ma'am. And we come back and we report it up to headquarters. Now, you know, two weeks later, some other team from Washington came down and convinced them otherwise. It wasn't me. It wasn't us. It was somebody else that did that. They were good at convincing. Yes. So we, you know, I'm sure people bring up the name Paul Benowitz and uh, you've brought him his name up a few times tonight. Can you describe who he was and, and where he lived and what activity he was engaging in and, and why you were notified of his activities? Paul Benowitz owned a company called Thunder Scientific, which was right outside the north gate of Kirtland Air Force Base. He had a, a classified government contract. He made uh, humidity sensors in other components and devices for submarines and for uh, space vehicles, uh, satellites, and um, I think even the space shuttle, different types of uh, temperature sensors and humidity and things like that. Um, he reported uh, he had seen some objects flying over Curling. He also lived in the Four Hills area of Albuquerque, which bordered the northeast corner of Kirtland Air Force Base. He was within a mile of Manzano uh, storage area. That was the largest nuclear weapon storage area in the free world. And you can imagine it was highly, uh, there's high security, it was a highly sensitive area. They had um, uh, security fences and they had also electronic, electronic security measures guarding the, 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 the base, guarding that, uh, they call it Manzano base. It was a, actually an entire base inside Kirtland. And he would photograph, he had cameras outside his patio and he would photograph objects and different things occurring, uh, over Kirtland. Now he's also a, a, a physicist. So he, he was also gathering electronic signals from the base. And he reported it uh, to the Air Force. He reported the, the commander of the 1608 Security Police Squadron, which was the the, the uh, unit responsible for security at Manzano. He reported to a guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel, uh, well, Major at the time, Major Ernie Edwards, later became a Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, there was uh, 
really, uh, uh, really fascinating photographs he had taken. And he had showed uh, Major Edwards these photographs. Well, Major Edwards immediately notified me. At that point, I was kind of intelligence officer of the base. He immediately notified me. He said, Rick, we need to talk immediately. I need you at my office or I need to come to your office immediately. Now, my office is some distance away. I said, well, is it, is it, is it, is it you know, national security? He said, it's priority one, which means it's something very important. I said, well, I'll, I'll come out there. So I drove out to, hit, to the Manzano and I had badges to get in. And, and uh, he showed me the pictures. I said, who gave you these pictures? He says, Paul Benowitz, the guy that was right outside the base. He said, look at all these tapes. He gave me all these tapes and these tapes have supposedly some kind of scientific data on there, some kind of electrical intelligence data on it. I said, and he told you this? Yeah. So I gathered everything up and went back to the office. I did a form and sent it in. Um, uh, but in the meantime, I contacted this guy and I asked him if he would consent to an interview. And I went out to, the, to his office and interviewed him. And that's how this whole whole Benowitz case developed and it lasted about you know, five years. He was in fact photographing highly classified uh, uh, aircraft drones. He was also, he also tapped into a highly classified, I mean really highly classified national security agency project out at the base where they were, and it's not, it's not classified anymore. So I'm telling you this is not classified. The, uh, they had a laser uh, on the base, they had two lasers. They had one there on the base, and they had one down the Stallion Range, which was uh, about 80 miles south of the base near uh, on Trinity Base, which was where the the first bottom atom bomb was detonated, te- tested out there. But it was st- called Stallion Range. They had another facility out there. But on the base, what they would do was they take this laser, and they every time a Soviet satellite would fly over, they direct the laser at the lenses of the Soviet satellite blinding of the satellite, uh, preventing the satellite from taking any pictures of the base. And that was at that then, back then, it was very high classified. But he was getting, he was collecting the signal of the laser frequency, which is, you know, about that. Well, I didn't know that at the time, but when we gathered it all, sent it to headquarters and they, they started, uh, uh, figuring out what he had and what he did and what he saw. They, they gave me all the authority. Uh, I mean, basically every single uh, thing that I requested uh, in the operations plan I could do. I mean, you know, other than kind of black project of assassinations or something like that, I couldn't do that, but, but everything else was authorized a budget unlimited. And uh, so that's how the Paul Benowitz, Case started. So ultimately, what was the uh, objective with Paul? Where, where, what did you want to see, or what did they want to see happen with Paul? Well, they wanted uh, me to convince Paul that what he was seeing was UFOs, extraterrestrial crafts. And Paul, he, he believed it anyway, Trump. right? Yeah. He already believed it. You're right, he right. was fully convinced. When I went out there and I said, well, you know, and I started a, a, a a good relationship with Paul and myself and another agent. We, I mean, we had a, a great relationship. And um, now you understand, Paul Benowitz was at that time, oh, probably in his late fifties. He smoked probably four or five packs of cigarettes a day. He drank um, a quart of, probably five quarts of uh, Coca Cola a day. Uh, and he was, uh, he was always jittery. Uh, he, and, and, but, but he was, he had a heck of a sense of humor. And when I went in and I, and, and after a few times of visiting and getting interviews and collecting information from him, I said, Paul, what do you think this is? He said, I, I know what it is. It's UFOs. It's extraterrestrial. They're, they're planning an invasion of earth. I said, is that what you think? Yep. I, I'm, I'm convinced he's crap. Look at him. And he showed me the other pictures that he'd had. Well, the pictures that he had given to, to Ernie went up. And he, Ernie Edwards gave to me, they went to the headquarters. He never got them back, but he had other pictures. I said, you know what? You might be right, Paul. I don't know what they are. And that's all I had to say. Paul totally believed it. 
And when this was all over with, years later, I, I sat down with Paul, tried to convince him he wouldn't believe me. You don't have to tell me. I know what, what it was. You, I know the United States has a, is scared that the aliens are going to attack. I know that. And you don't have to try to convince me otherwise. So that was Paul. We, we really didn't have to do much. Who but is- there was a lot of other aspects to this program, uh, this incident, this uh, investigation that occurred that I disclosed at the USO, UFO Megacon that nobody knew in the past, no, nobody knew before. A lot of things that Paul saw photographed was not uh, a U.S. US uh, military drone or classified. He actually filmed some things that we didn't know what it was. Uh, he filmed, he was a pilot. Paul was a pilot. He had a, he was a private pilot at a, at a, uh, uh, at his own plane, uh, a Cessna 180, and he would fly all over. You'd fly up to Archuleta Peak, up the Dolce and back, take pictures. Well, he had this, uh, assistant, one of his assistants that worked in the laboratory with him on a, on a trip. And it was a Saturday afternoon. He was, he flew up to Dolce, he landed, uh, flew around Archipit, Leather Peak, uh, refueled the Dolce, and it was flying back. And it was right around uh, Springer, New Mexico, when this huge craft, uh, he photographed. I mean, the, the guy next to him, is, is, is a, his uh, assistant at the lab, had a camera with him, a, a cam- Canon in 81, uh, photographed it. Made a number of photographs of this craft, this huge diameter craft. And, when, and this was probably a year or two into the investigation. Uh, Paul got back, and it was, it was late uh, uh, Saturday, and he immediately called me. Uh, and and, and my, I was single at the time. I was actually getting ready to go out on a date, and Paul called me at my uh, apartment, and he said, you need to see this immediately. I photographed some. And he went on and on, and I thought, okay. So I had kind of proposed for my date and went out there to his house, and I looked. At, he had already developed it. He had a, his own battle lab. And I looked at this and I, I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe what he took take a picture of. I mean, this was like, this was a classical uh, UFO. And it had writing on the side of it. It had, had symbols on the side of it. And, and these symbols were as clear as can be. And what was it? It was something we didn't have. I took it and I sent it back to headquarters and they were dumbfounded too saying, wow, you know, what the heck was that? And they, we, they all went and checked with the radar, the, the, AT, uh, uh, the uh, air traffic control and uh, uh, the radar approach control, Albuquerque radar system. Uh, they didn't have it on there. They never, 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 never took a, picked up a signature from that craft at, at that particular time about you know, two o'clock in the afternoon on that Saturday. They never, never. So it was uh, blind to radar. Did Paul ever uh, catch on to what your objective was and, and how you were relating to him? And, and did he, did he ever no. approach you about that? Uh, he knew, he knew what I was trying to tell him years later, but uh, he was, co- he was 100% cooperative. I mean, he, he, he did everything uh, that we asked him to do. Uh, and then, uh, but what Paul, uh, there was a lot of things that Paul was gathering and that we couldn't explain. And that's what made a, uh, this, uh, a develop, we developed it into a, a secondary investigation into actual ET presence. We have a, actually a special case category for that. We had to, and we brought in some other people, other people, not just myself, was many other people involved. There was many other agencies involved in this. NSA was involved in it. The DIA was involved in it. The FBI was involved in it. Uh, and, and there was, and then there was also a third, um, a part of this you know, whole program is where Paul had a, uh, person working at the laboratory that was, um, uh, making trips to Mexico City. And he was photographed near the uh, Soviet embassy. So um, we had an espionage part of this 
So it was, it was a comp, as I said earlier in the beginning uh, of your, this interview was it, it, the Paul Benoist case was extremely complicated, it involved a lot of different aspects of intelligence. But then again, intelligence is complicated and it's, in, <laughs> it's meant to be, I mean, that's, that's, that's why it, it works as well as it does, right? Yeah. And, and unless you've been in it and I always tell these people who claim that they know it all and, be, and even though they've never been in intelligence, they write books and hear the second, third and fourth hand information. You, you don't really know what intelligence uh, uh, encompasses until you're involved in it. Like I had a conversation with a person just recently about spies. Oh yeah. It should be real easy to catch spies. Yeah. yeah you try it. You know, the best way of catching spies is through counter espionage and counter espionage is, recruiting people uh, that are working against the, uh, your adversary and let them catch the spies for you. They're going to, they're going to be so trusted with, if you, if they're good uh, agents, they can be so trusted with your adversary that they're, they're going to, their adversary is going to do the spies that they're working. And so that's how you catch a spy through counterintelligence, counterespionage. And uh, he could understand that because it's too complicated. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, it is. it's a, Conundrum within an enigma, you know, it's, uh, it's complicated. One of the other stories that I'd heard a bit about, and I don't know too much about, but I w- I'd caught it on the, on, on YouTube a little bit. Um, what was it, what was the meeting? And I don't know who Jerry Miller was. You could just dis- explain who he was, but you had dinner with, uh, Jerry Miller and Paul. And that story is really interesting to me. <clears throat> Jerry Miller was a, um, a scientist with the air force, uh, Operational Test and Evaluation Center uh, at Kirtland. And they're the agency that controls the Air Force testing uh, squadrons and, and, and units. Uh, they, uh, Air, Air Force uh, Test Flight Center, De- Detachment 3, which was which is Area 51, Green Lake, is directly reporting to uh, Apotech. So Jerry Miller was a scientist with Appletech. In years prior, he was a Project Blue Book investigator. He, he investigated uh, UFO sightings for Project Blue Book back in the late 50s and 60s. <clears throat> Paul invited uh, Jerry, myself, and Steve Atz, another agent that worked with me on this case, over to his house for dinner. And it was a late autumn uh, night. We went to his house at a my marvelous dinner with his wife. We came in and sat on the couch. I sat on the couch. Steve sat to my right. To my left was Paul, and to to his left was Jerry in a lounge chair. They both were in lounge chairs, and uh, we were talking, uh, just talking casually, talking about different things. His wife had had brought in uh, some brandy, but I I declined the brandy. But the others were drinking some brandy and. All of a sudden, I noticed this bright light on the bottom. I'm looking at a wall in front of me. Uh, the, the, directly in front of me, uh, on the, I think the south side of the house was a wall. And then there's a, a sliding glass door to the far right. And I looked, I see this ball of light on the bottom portion of the wall. And I, I first thought it was a reflection. I sat up. And when Steve asked it was next to me, he jabbed me and I looked over him and he pointed. And then I looked over at Jerry and I nodded over towards the wall. And then Jerry looked over and then now the light was right next to Jerry. And this ball of light started moving up the wall, flying around the room. Um, unbeknownst to me, Jerry Miller immediately checked his watch. And that comes into play sometime later. And I watched it for a while and Paul says, Oh, they came to say hi. <laughs> and I said, and, and it, it lasted for, Oh, 11, 10, 11, 12 minutes. And it went right through the ceiling. And I looked over at Paul and I looked, and I looked at my, Steve next to me and he was dumbfounded. And I looked at Jerry and I said, you know, Paul, what the hell was that? He said, that's, the orbs. That's what we, we deal with all the time. His wife comes out and she says, they don't normally come out with company. 
And which was, you know, everybody kind of laughed and chuckled. Uh, but I thought, my God, and what the heck was that? And his wife, his wife looked at me and says, now, now do you want a brandy, Rick? <laughs> 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 I took a brandy then. I didn't know what I was doing. Brandy. But we, we immediately went out in the car and we got some equipment, brought it in, started looking around. Jerry started measuring things. And I said to Jerry, I said, it was just me and Jerry. We were outside. I said, Jerry, you look at your clock. Watch. Why? I said, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any missing time. And it wasn't any. So, but we could never, we could never explain it. He, it happens to him all the time. He said, uh, not all the time, but you know, once, twice, three times a week. What, what caused it? We could never figure it out. We looked, we tried to imitate it. We tried to duplicate. We couldn't do it. Couldn't do it with a flashlight. Couldn't do it with a laser beam. Couldn't do it with. So what it was, I don't know. To this day, I don't know. And the, and the other uh, very fascinating thing that happened to Paul was he had a computer monitor. Now, uh, I was accused of giving him a computer monitor, but I never gave it to him. Uh, Alan Hynek got involved in, in the Paul Benowitz investigation through the civilian side with Leo uh, Sprinkle. And they gave him a monitor. I came to visit him one day uh, to Paul and he, and Paul said, Hey, I got visited by Ellen Heine. And he gave me this monitor which was just sitting behind his desk in his office at his, his house. And I looked at the monitor and I said, well, what do they want you to do with it? They wanted me to hook it up with, rather than using mine and use this one. I said, why did they, why, why did they tell you why? Oh, it's a better monitor. It has a better, uh, 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 just better uh, picture. I said, okay. And what Paul was receiving on this monitor, he had a, he had a, uh, a Commodore computer uh, and uh, he had a, um, uh, he had the computer and he had programs that he had, he had, uh, well, it wasn't him, but somebody in the, in the lab, one of his assistants, one of somebody uh, that was computer literate in this lab had wrote some programs so he could collect data on his computer. And Paul would look at his computer and there were these symbols that would come up. And he said they were alien symbols and he was trying to, to uh, 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 translate them. And he had them written down. I mean, he had, he had notebooks, uh, the three ring style wide rule. He had the legal pads, he just full of these symbols. I mean, literally hundreds of these notebooks that he would copy these symbols down. And we actually, he gave us a notebook. Uh, we sent it up to NSA, uh, sent it over to, the, to their uh, code breakers, started to figure out what this meant. I never received anything back from them. I don't know if they ever translated it or not. But uh, Paul had, and, and then one once, um, another kind of a disclosure I did at uh, the UFO Megacon was the picture that, appeared on his his uh, computer screen. Now, it wasn't Heineck's computer screen, it was his. Um, was that uh, he had a picture of a, an, an alien, EDT, in color. That he took a picture of with his camera, took the picture off, because back then you couldn't do screenshots or something on a computer. But he took his camera and he had a, he had a very sophisticated I can't, can't remember now what it kind of was, but he had a very sophisticated camera. He had taken a picture of it and I had, he'd given me the picture and I actually presented that first time ever seen at the UFO Megacon of a, of an alien. He's saying that's the leader. Now, the only problem with the, the colored picture is his monitor wasn't colored. It was black and white. How did he get a colored picture of this thing on a black and white? <laughs> We couldn't understand Especially it. a Commodore. Yeah, a Commodore. Yeah. And because when, when, we, when he took the picture, I said, I, we immediately, the, some of the people that were experts, my tech services experts in photography and so forth, our photo lab people said, where did he take this off? He couldn't have taken this off of a computer screen. He said he did. He said, Is it, does he have a colored screen? 
But then it hit me like, holy cow, no, it's black and white because I've seen it a hundred times. So I went back over there. We took the screen. We took that monitor and took it back to the, the base, and we had it analyzed by experts. And it's not color. There's nothing in there. There's not a colored cathode ray tube or nothing. It's black and white. How did he take, how did a color picture appear on his screen? And, and so we thought, well, he couldn't have, the other explanation was, even though the first picture was of it, I mean, you could see the screen, the, the monitor, you could see the monitor. He didn't take it off of another picture on the wall or something. And then the second one, it was a close up. We thought maybe he taped it. I said, Paul, can you get this picture back up some way? He said, I've been trying to communicate with this creature and, and, and I'm trying to get him to come back and talk to me. So he called me at 2.30 in the morning. Uh, the, well, he, he calls me my apartment. He tell, tells me what it was. I get it. I jump in my OSI vehicle. I drive out there as fast as I can. And I get there and... I have, I, I called another agent, a technical agent, Steve Fleming, another Steve, but he, he was the photographic expert. We get out there and it was still there on the screen. We took pictures. And when we, then we, then Steve says, I want to take the, take it apart. I want to take your, your screen monitor apart. And he did it right there. Uh, he turned it off and took it apart. And it wasn't a, he, uh, Steve thought it was, a projected image from inside that so, somebody put something in there that had projected the image. Like he, somebody put a photograph in there, put a light behind it and projected against the screen. And he was, Steve Lynn was thoroughly convinced that that's what, what it was. So we're, t- uh, Paul and I are out in the little uh, hallway of his house and, and while Steve's in there taking the computer apart, and I, I was convinced that's what it was too. And I was trying to soften Paul up that, you know, maybe, you know, somebody got in and did something. To you. He said, no, but nobody ever got in here. This is a secure room. And then Paul looked at me. He said, I know what he's thinking. I know what he's going to do, but he's not going to find it in there. I said, what, what's he going to do? He thinks I projected that. That's not possible. So after, I don't know. 45 minutes or however long it took Steve to take it apart. I walked in and I said, well, what do you think? He said, I was wrong. I don't know where it is. It's not projected. I don't know how he got it on there. And Paul says, now if you want to, and but Paul got a little upset and he kind of cussed me and said, you don't believe me. So if you cuss word, I'll tell you how it happened. So we said, you know, Paul, I don't want you to get upset. I'm sorry. We just have to make sure we touch every single base. And he said, and then he, and he has this antenna that we had missed because we had thoroughly examined everything in that, his office. But there was an antenna coming out of that monitor that he had made. Uh, 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 I'm not an electrician, but an electronics person, but some kind of adapter that went into the back. It was an antenna that went up on his roof and he had this, really strange looking antenna that he had built. And he said, that's where it came from. I said, so we don't know. We could never understand it. <laughs> never, never could understand it. Um, you're going to read about Heineck giving him the monitor and all this stuff. And, and it was supposed to be secret, but we had, uh, we'd marked the uh, Heineck's, uh, uh, monitor gave him, we examined it because we thought that with Leo involved in it, that this is some kind of a trap for Paul, but there wasn't anything wrong. It was, a, it was right out of the box. The, the, it was a new monitor or something that I think Alan Heine used, but it was, it wasn't anything. It was, it hadn't been tampered with or anything. Amazing man, Paul Benowitz. Um, what year did you work at area 51? I was there twice. I was there a temporary duty in, in 84 and one, and one time in 85. I was there a total about 95 days the first time and the second time about 100 days. Was your duty the same? Both times you were there, was it different? What was your duty at Area 51? We were, we were the, uh, we were counterintelligence there. 
And we were doing uh, investigations, suitability investigations for anyone that had a, a high level security clearance that had been involved in some kind of, uh, you know, maybe suspected espionage or, or, or criminal activity or, um, or, or, or back then those days, uh, uh, you could, you couldn't be a homosexual. So if there was some kind of a, a complaint involving that, that, uh, area, uh, we were investigated. Um, and w- we were myself, there was uh, four of us that went out there that the agents that were assigned out there had, had uh, you know, one guy, one was sick and one went someplace and anyways, we had to backfill their spot. And we had, there were, and since we already already had the Q clearance, which was at the, in the, in the nine Q, there's two different types of you know, a Q clearance and a nine Q clearance. Nine Q was the special access to the UFO stuff. We were briefed into a number of programs out there. And we also investigated some very, very, uh, strange occurrences that occurred. Uh, one particular case involving a, uh, a, uh, device that was planted right next to the perimeter by, a, 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 obviously a Soviet spy. And, uh, because it was Russian made equipment that was, uh, collecting electronics data. And we, we actually, cl- uh, 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 found it, turned it, uh, turned it over. Uh, the FBI got involved in it, trying to trace who did it. But, and that was a long investigation. And we, we also, uh, was involved in some other things, uh, that, uh, had, uh, was probably still classified today. I've talked to a couple other employees, <clears throat> TD Barnes and another one. They, they had good, good memories and good, good experiences at area 51. What was your time like there? I had good, good memories. I, uh, we had very, uh, good people working out there, uh, very dedicated employees, uh, for the most part, the ones that, uh, the few, very, very, very few that we investigated were, uh, you know, got in trouble uh, over one thing or another. Um, the, um, the Bob Lazar, um, of course I was there before, well before Bob Lazar, but, uh, I, I learned of, uh, of a, of a very highly classified location that Lazar talks about, but, uh, I, I knew it of a, of a, of a different, uh, uh, classification or a different name. It was the, the S2 complex. S4 was underground and I never had access to, to S4. So I never was there. I never went down underground. So I can't say what he saw was, I uh, can't verify what he saw. I know the facilities existed. In fact, during the time I was there, in 80, the first time I was there, 84, they were building, they were drilling a tunnel from one point to another point. Um, a, um, a team from uh, a, 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 actually a, a, a private uh, drilling company that was working over at the Nevada test site, which is not far away. They would do, drill holes and do the atomic tests on the ground. They came over and drilled uh, um, caves. I said holes in the caves uh, that they were trying. They were uh, uh, expanding the S four complex. But like I said, I w- I never had access to the S four, so I never went in to S four. I never had access down there. S two was the opening. The cl- the uh, uh, covert opening area where the, if you, you go in, you, uh, and I described it and, uh, to, uh, during the conference, uh, and, it, and there were several others that knew about this that said, you know, I was absolutely right. I also had the badges I had, uh, I had two badges I used out there that I still had access to, took pictures of that, uh, proved that I was actually worked out there. Um, but the, uh, the entrance into the complex, S2 complex, was exactly uh, as uh, you would enter, uh, but the elevators, uh, the large elevators where you would go down to the different layers, uh, levels, uh, was under the S2 complex. And like I said, I, I never had access, I never had a clearance for that, and I saw, I never went down there. 
So what kind of security gets you in and out of, of Area 51 back in 1981? What was what was that like and how restricted was it? And um, I mean, obviously they kept you in and and when you needed to get out, they let you out. What, what, what was that like? What was that procedure? Well, you had a, uh, you had the Air Force, you had uh, DIA, you had CIA, you had um, NSA, and then you had um, the military unit that guarded it. The, 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 the security, uh, the containment area security was done by DET-3, Security Police Squadron out of Dallas Air Force Base. The, uh, the outer perimeter was done by Wackenhut back in those days. Um, you could, we flew in uh, every time. I only, do, I only I drove in once, and that was a, kind of a nightmare because I drove in from uh, Mercury, which was at, at the test site, and I went all the way up and drove across uh, on, out of Gate 700 uh, into Gate 3, Papoose Lake, and then up to uh, Area 51. I only did it once, but most of the time it was flying in. You fly in. Uh, before you got on the plane at McGarren, you you had to you had to present a uh, your your um, a badge for Area 51. Uh, they scanned it. Um, they um, uh, yeah, we had fingerprint back then. We didn't have the handprint. Uh, they were experimenting with a handprint later on. But and then when we got out, we landed. Uh, we went to the terminal. You had an exchange badge system. You had a second badge, which had a number on it and all your your personal uh, identity, and you exchanged that for another badge that you had to wear all time, 24 hours a day. You couldn't sleep without any of that. It was every anytime you uh, you had to have it on you all the time. So uh, you, we lived in a dorm out there for the time I was there. Now you could leave, uh, you could fly out on weekends. Uh, they had flights. Two flights. They had one late Friday, I think it was six, I think. And it was like a 40, I think it was a 40 minute flight. Uh, and then there was one Saturday morning early. I can't remember what time it was Saturday morning. And you fly to Vegas and, 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 and then you do whatever and then you come back. I believe it was two flights Sunday, uh, at four and six or something to that effect. Um, you, uh, we're closely monitored. Every, every, almost every building that you went into, there was some kind of security checkpoint, um, some kind of security access in, into a, in our OSI building. Our, our building was number 432 on the base. We were not far from the hangar complex. In the main hangar, uh, there was an underground facility there, uh, and, um, I, I've never been in it, but it was a huge, uh, I mean, massive uh, elevator uh, that li- that if you, you you could put a, I, I think you probably could an SR seventy one on that, and it w- would go underground. And I don't, I, I think there was two or maybe three levels there, and that's different from Papoose. But um, we had a theater on the base. We had a dining facility. We had a small uh, 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 PX shop at. There was a nice gym, gymnasium. Uh, so there was something to do. There was a small service club. Um, so it was something to do to keep you active during the. The movies were first run movies. Uh, they only they only they only showed it once. At, I think it was seven o'clock at night. Uh, but but there was a theater. There was, I think every night they had a had a movie, and so um, the dormitories were somewhat like a well. I was there was different size, different uh, style dorms, but the uh, we were in a bachelor officer quarters that was uh, like a little studio apartment. You had a little kitchenette and, uh, and, a, and a little dining room and a bedroom was separate. So that's what I remember of Area 51. Was higher or advanced technology a common sight at Area 51? I mean, were you, were you seeing that out in the open? No, no. You, you would see um, if they were transporting something from one point to another, it would be in a closed trailer, a bed of tarp over it. 
but you didn't see uh, uh, the alien crafts uh, being transported or uh, no, no, you, you, you wouldn't see that. Uh, every now and then they'd have a, um, a blackout. They would do a blackout where they were bringing in something or, or, uh, or taking something out or moving something. And everybody had to be within a building with shades down and there'd be a blackout. Uh, and you had to, you know, you had to participate in that. I mean, you can't sneak a, a view or something like that because you get into a lot of trouble. And you, and it was very easy. But then, I mean, I've seen many people making very simple mistakes and getting their badges uh, and their access withdrawn. And for contractors or for some other uh, people, that, that meant you're losing your job if you, if you, you violate it. So the discipline was good out there. I mean, there's a blackout period. You did exactly what was told. And we even had to went to the blackout. We didn't know what it was. We didn't, we, we didn't just because we were, both agents had certain clearances. We didn't have access to everything that was going on out there. I mean, there was so many, so many projects going on out there. You saw, I mean, the, there was one hangar, the far south hangar, or no, so far west hangar had, uh, the MIGs, had uh, uh, had a um, Swedish aircraft, had a MIG, had had a Chinese aircraft, uh, had all the foreign uh, type aircrafts, uh, the communist ones in the, in there. Uh, you saw those, uh, and you still had to have a clearance. But we we I've, I've been in those hangars and saw them. And then they had uh, a, a lot of projects. They had two they had two massive towers out there that we were doing laser tests on, uh, and then they had a facility, uh, in, uh, out towards Papoose. I think they called it remote site two or, uh, one, uh, three. Anyways, it was a, uh, another classified area. They had an underground facility there. They had one of the largest, uh, electro magnets in the world underground. And they were trying, they were doing uh, tests. And I, I, I didn't, I never saw this. I'm just, I was told and read a, read a, a report once, a classified report on that they were, they were doing uh, time travel experiments or trying to. I don't think any of it was actually successful. And that was the second time I was there in 86. So, or 85. So, uh, but there were all other, a lot of other things. There were a lot of contractors out there doing a number of things. And, I would imagine uh, what Lazar was saying uh, was in fact true about the, the number of contractors trying to reverse engineer things. So are contractors able to uh, move freely about the premises just like uh, you were with your, with your colleagues? Yeah, they, they, uh, they were, uh, you know, as far as I know, I mean, I didn't keep track of the contractors in that re- respect, but I, uh, the, they were on the planes with us. I'm sure they had, uh, you know, restrictions of when they could go and when, and, and uh, um, the, for the most part, when I was there, there were three shifts, the day shift, the gray, uh, twin shift and the graveyard shift. And that was 24 hours a day, even on a weekend. Uh, but you know, we, uh, OSI, we only had to keep two agents on the base uh, on weekends. They had, they were on call the whole time, but the others could leave. So we rotated weekends. I mean, a lot of weekends we had to work there, but, but we had, we had the contractors on the plane with us leaving and going, but I, I'm not really sure what their, uh, uh, restrictions were, if they had any or not. How are you able to talk about these activities that you've had during your, your military career freely without uh, repercussion or penalty of law? Well, I signed a security oath in 1988, and I presented that to uh, at the UFO con. It was for 25 years, and that long expired. Um, I presented, uh, um, I talked to uh, OSI uh, a number of times about the subject, and they uh, told me to uh, do whatever I want to do. Was, I'm not on a security oath anymore. So I'll take the take the heat for it if, if they want to come back and 
say, well, why are you talking about it now? I haven't had any uh, other than one particular instance. I mentioned something about, oh, gosh, it was 20, probably 2008 or 2009. Uh, I said something about a case. Uh, and I, all, I, all I said was mentioning where it happened and what and it was basically involved. Well, still classified. And I was visited by uh, an OSI agent, and he told me that I need to cease and desist on that subject matter because that is still classified. And I said, okay, I won't say another word about it. So that that is the only time I've ever been cautioned. Did you leave your career with, with more questions than answers, or did you feel that, that, that you learned everything that you could possibly learn in your tenure there with the military? And the government. No, I, 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 I had so many questions when I left because over the years I was briefed into different programs, and one of the one of the things that I was never briefed into initially was the abduction uh, phenomena. I, I was I was never told there was abductions, but I actually investigated a case involved that, that Myrna and Hansen uh, that. It was another part of the Paul, ben, Paul Benowitz case, and I investigated that. Well, about, you know, weeks into this, I suddenly one day two DIA officers arrive at the OSI office at Kirtland, and they come in and they said, they start talking to me about this, uh, and I verified who they were and had badges and so forth, uh, who they were, and, and, and they asked me about the Myrna Hansen case, and I told them, he said, well, we're here to take that over. And I said, you guys are going to take it over? He said, yeah, we're, we're going to assume it. I said, well, what section are you from? He said, we're from the abduction uh, bureau. And it was a long time. I said, abduction? <laughs> he said, you guys work on abduction? He said, we, we investigate abduction. I said, and, we, and the DIA has a separate bureau that does that? He said, oh, yeah, we've been doing it for years. Well, I never knew that. So I just learned something. I said, my God, I didn't know that. So that tells you that the government believes in it. And I've been investigated for a long time. Uh, who so, had- no, I, 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 left with, I, I left with a lot of questions. Over the years, I learned a lot. I mean, I was involved in a lot. I had more cases uh, uh, exposed to me. I mean, I had more things I had to be briefed into. But, uh, you know, at the end, I mean, my... Uh, Security pledge showed all the different uh, things I had access to, uh, uh, such as you know, Starlight, Project Starlight, Project Seven Doors, Project Gamma Swing, Candid Sky, Project Radiant Bravo, Project Might, Project Auburn Blue, Project MedStar. That's just to name a few. So, uh, and so I had a lot of access, but. Uh, when I retired, I, I thought, or when I left OSI, I thought, um, there's a lot more to this. And then I joined the, uh, retired, uh, intelligence officers association and we meet, um, at least a yearly or when somebody dies or a funeral or something over the years, I've been a member for a long, long time. And you, you list, you sit in meetings, uh, uh, around the bar or in a hotel room and, listen to these old timers talk about some of the things they did and some of the things they had access to. And then I realized that I didn't know it all. I mean, there was so much more to the story that I didn't know. Absolutely amazing. Who has it right in the, the UFO community? If you were to throw some names out there of UFO experiences, experiencers or researchers, who has it right? Uh, Linda Howell, I think is the, the best uh, UFO researcher. And of course I had a, a case against her years ago. Um, she has, and the reason she does is such a good re, uh, investigator is she has some extraordinary sources, a real, I mean, real uh, sources of, of people who have had real access. And I know there's some things that have occurred uh, that you know, people don't believe she'll, she'll bring something up that, that is unbelievable and I can't be true. I know she made that up, but in fact, it's real. I mean, there's some, there's a lot of the things that she's bringing up and a lot of things I didn't know about, but some of the things I did know about, 
I realize that she has has good sources. But then there's some people out there that are, uh, I mean, there's, um, you know, I, I don't follow that group. I can't, I'm not an expert in the UFO community. I stay away from it because there's so many people in there I, I distrust. There's so many people in there that are absolute, total phonies that they, they make up their stories. They make up their sources. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, particularly single out any particular one, but there's uh, very few out there that, that really get the story straight. My guest has been Rick Doty. And if you don't know Mr. Doty, Google his name and you'll be quickly overwhelmed. Mr. Doty, I'm giving you the final word tonight. What do you want people to remember you by and uh, what experiences do you want to be remembered by? Well, I became a Air Force OSI special agent on 78. I, um, I served my country. I served the, the Air Force. I served the Air Force OSI uh, admirably, I, I've gotten uh, several awards for what I did. I've never been punished for what I did or what I didn't do. Everything I did during my career was entirely sanctioned by the government. Um, and I think only common sense would dictate that because if, if I hadn't been sanctioned for all the things I did over the years, I'd probably be, still be a, I'd, I'd be a prisoner in, in uh, Leavenworth or some, some other place. But, uh, you know, obviously that's not the case. Uh, there have been a number of people, a number of colonels, one particular general that spoke up for me some years ago. Uh, and so I, I'm the real thing. I, I had the knowledge. Uh, and, uh, and now I'm uh, in a retirement phase and just sit back and watch the UFO, UFO community uh, uh, damage themselves. Anything coming up for you, sir, that uh, we should know about? Well, I, 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 mean, I wrote a book. I had the entire manuscript written um, and uh, reviewed and rewritten, and it's ready to be published. Unfortunately, I sent it, I had to send it to the uh, government to be approved, and out of the 532 pages that uh, the manuscript covered, uh, they uh, classified 327 of them. And now I've been fighting, <laughs> I've been fighting with the uh, Air Force for the last... Uh, uh, about nine months, uh, well, actually now it's 10 months and we've, uh, got an attorney involved in, a, and so we're trying to negotiate something, uh, but, uh, it's going to end up, uh, it'd be about 12 chapters. Uh, I haven't really named it yet, but, uh, uh, chapters are, uh, early life, my training, uh, first assignment at Kirtland, the Coyote Canyon incident, Paul Benoit, Dugway contact, uh, area 51, Catching a Spy, Counter Espionage Europe, Dorothy, uh, Kansas case, which is a, a remarkable case, the download, uh, leaving, downloading, leaving the enigma, and then the last chapter, Life After. You are the real thing. Mr. Richard Doty, thank you very, very much. I appreciate this so much. You're very welcome. My Alien Life Podcast. You can find my website at www.myalienlifepodcast.com and please subscribe to my latest downloads at iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and at podbean.com. And please follow me and like me on Facebook and Twitter. My Alien Life is written and produced for broadcast at Studio 254 in the Northern Rocky Mountains. The music you are hearing is produced and created by Elion. You can find all Elion's work online at Heart Dance Records.